Congratulations, you so deserve your star of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And thank you for including me, your fake mom who left you home alone not once but twice <laughs> to share in this happy occasion. I'm so proud of you. God bless. What's going on everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people behavioral analysis and practical psychology on stages and television shows all over the world. This week we're looking at a video of Macaulay Culkin, the actor who famously portrayed Kevin in the holiday classic Home Alone and Home Alone 2. Just last week he accepted a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and delivered a pretty heartfelt speech. Amongst the attendees was his on-screen mother, Catherine O'Hara, who also gave a very emotional speech. But what do their body language, facial expressions, and word choice reveal about what emotions they're actually experiencing on that stage? Given that the holidays are around the corner, I thought this would be such a great video to look at, not only because these are the stars of one of the most classic holiday movies, but also because there's a lot of really great nonverbal communication here that could teach us a lot about how to spot real emotions when they're happening. So we're going to start with Catherine O'Hara's speech. Now once again, this is the actress who played the mom in Home Alone. She played Kate McAllister and she gave a speech on this day at the Hollywood Walk of Fame ceremony to honor Macaulay Culkin and his career. Let's take a look. to stand here and listen to this. I know, me too. Let me too. give you a chair. I know, right? A chair for I the man. I the side, so the sun's on. Okay, yeah, smart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after Home Alone opened, I went to see it uh, at a Saturday matinee in a theater packed with shiny, happy children and their parents, and it was thrilling for all of us. But at one point, I saw two boys get up out of their seats, so not wanting to leave the movie. <laughs> But after having already sucked back their giant sodas, they really had to go. So they started running up the aisle, and then suddenly panicked that they might miss something great. They turned around, looked back at the screen, and one of them said, it's okay, no, it's just the mom. <laughs> and they kept running. I say, bright boys, bright boys, home alone, was, is, and always will be a global, a beloved global sensation, the reason, the reason it's that, the reason families all over the world can't let a year go by without watching and loving Home Alone together is because of Macaulay Culkin. Yes? <laughs> yes, he had a most excellent script and a wonderful director, but it is Macaulay's perfect performance as Kevin McAllister that gave us that little every boy on an extraordinary adventure. I want to start by talking about a gesture that caught my attention towards the beginning of her speech. And it's when she's talking about having gone to the movie theater and she says that it was thrilling for all of us and we see her hand open up like this and her hand moves outwards like this. So fingers up with this throwaway gesture. Now there's a lot of research out there on the orientation of the hands as we speak and the meaning that they might have. And in most cases, they're not universal. In other words, different cultures use different orientations of the hands. However, the research has shown that pretty much everywhere in the world, the palm outwards like this with the fingers up is consistent with negation. So some sort of no or stop or even trying to stop someone to get their attention. Now, in my experience, I found that when it's combined with this throwaway gesture, it's often a casual negation. So you might ask someone if they want help with something and they might go, no, I'll take care of it later. Or they might say, no, don't worry about it. You know, if you ask them about some bad news, don't worry about it, not a big deal. So when I saw Catherine O'Hara doing that gesture, she talked about how going to the movies to watch Home Alone was thrilling for all of us. I was like, that's interesting. Why do we have a stop gesture with this throwaway? Was it not thrilling? Did something happen? And I was having a hard time with that. I was a little bit stuck, but I noticed two other things. The first is that as she's doing that, we see her eyes open up with her eyebrows going up. And this is called an eyebrow flash. And there's a lot of research on this. I have a whole video talking about why we know what the eyebrow flash means and all the studies behind it. But to sum it up very quickly, eyebrow flash is often consistent with either surprise, emphasis, or some sort of social connection or social greeting or acceptance or approval, something along those lines. So in that moment, I noticed that it happened with that throwaway gesture. The other thing I noticed as the video went on is that we see her do this gesture quite a few more times. And some of those times, it is with a negation. For example, a few seconds after that one, she says that the two boys 
got out of their seats, so not wanting to leave the movie. And we clearly see that as she's saying, so not wanting to leave the movie, very consistent with negation. So not wanting to leave the movie. However, I did notice that later in the speech, more than once, she does that same gesture when she's emphasizing something that's not negative. So on numerous occasions, we see her kind of do this with the eyebrows, with that throwaway gesture, and there's a few times where it's towards the camera, but it even happens when she's talking to him, so it doesn't look like it to us, but it's that same gesture, and she's not saying anything negative in those moments. So if we go back to that first one where she's saying it was thrilling for all of us, and we combine it with that eyebrow flash, which often happens with emphasis, I think it's pretty likely that in that moment she's emphasizing how thrilling it was. It is possible that it's a negation, that there was something there that wasn't so thrilling. There is that possibility. In fact, it's possible that the negation might be something along the lines of, I can't tell you how thrilling it was. Because very often with emphasis, when someone's trying to express that they can't put it into words, we do see signs of negation. We might see the head go side to side as they go, it was so incredible. You might see that hand go like this. You might see shrugs, lip compressions, because the person's thinking like, I don't have the words. I don't have the words to tell you how amazing this was. Okay, moving on, let's take it from the top. So she comes up on stage and there's a hug. And I think this is such a great moment of behavioral analysis. And this will be a great little life tip that you can remember anytime you see two people hugging. Whenever you see two people hugging, ask yourself a question. Are you feeling that the energy is going inwards or outwards? Just look at it, use your intuition entirely. Is it going inwards or outwards? So sometimes you see two people hug and you could see kind of like it's the fingertips and their, and their pelvis is leaning out like this and they're looking away with their eyes. And in those moments, you kind of can feel that, okay, either one or both parties don't want this hug to be happening. There's discomfort here. With this hug that we saw in the beginning, we really see the energy coming inwards. So the one exception is she doesn't completely wrap her arms around him, but she's been doing this for a very long time and she knows that a big bear hug like that can ruin the clothes, can mess things up, and then you have to come out of that and groom. So her arms are grabbing onto his arms, but notice how she's pulling him inwards. You could see that pull, you could see that tension. He's lowering his head, on her, they're holding it for a moment, and we can really feel that they're kind of pulling each other closer. And it's not just the body language, it's also what they're saying. He says, thanks mama, in a very soft tone. There's also a pause, so no one's rushing to get out of this. And as they break away from it, there's laughter. As they break away from it, she gives them a bit of an arm rub like this. So no one's rushing, no one's distancing. It's a very warm moment before she begins to speak. As soon as she breaks away from that hug, she says, I don't know you're gonna stand here and listen to this. And we see something classic. We see what we call arms akimbo. And arms akimbo is, again, a very studied body language posture, which is the arms extended like this. Now, like a lot of things, arms akimbo doesn't have one specific meaning. We can see it in a lot of contexts, but very often we do see it when there's a conflict. When someone's trying to establish that there's something here that needs to be taken care of. Notice how when we do this position, we seem bigger, we seem more like a threat. So when we're thinking of conflict or trying to establish some sort of authority, we might see arms akimbo. Now in this case, it's perfect because she's literally talking about a conflict, a problem that there is. I don't know, you have to stand there, get the man a chair. But if you notice her tone, it's that kind of exaggerated tone that she often uses in her acting. Stand here and listen to I this. know, me too. They give you a chair. I know, right? A chair for I the man. The 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 okay, yeah. smart. In fact, anybody who watches the comedy Schitt's Creek will recognize that tone because she's one of the stars of that sitcom and she has that very high-pitched, kind of dragged out tone that she's using right here. Do you not know my middle name? Of course I do. I blessed you with it. It's very different from the way she speaks during her speech, which is lower and calmer. So in this moment, especially with that exaggerated arms akimbo like this, you know, she's like leaning back, making this gesture, looking around, get the man a chair, and then she quickly comes off it, okay, and prepares for her speech. So I think this was just one of those little comedy bits that we often see in the beginning of a speech to relax the crowd. In fact, we even see this very often in like a corporate setting where the CEO is giving a speech and starts with, some kind of a joke to lighten the mood, and that's very much what this feels like. I don't think she's actually like, get them out of chair. I don't think it's real. It's just this little bit of, there's a problem here, get them out of chair, and now we start the serious speech. There is something she does in her speech that shows, to me, such a display of professionalism, and it's 
the story she decides to tell. So the story she tells, I've seen so many speeches by so many actors, by so many performers, and the speech she chose to tell lifted him at her cost. So because it's about these two kids who are gonna go to the bathroom and we're waiting for a moment to go and they said, oh, it's just the mom. So it's just her, don't worry about it, we can go now. And the point she's trying to make is that people don't watch Home Alone for me, people watch Home Alone for you. Now again, in the performance space, this is so rare because in most cases, in situations like this, where a co-star comes up to tell a story, it's usually a story that involves the two of them, something that lifts both of them. And as nice as that is, there's something about this that's so incredibly humble because by doing that, she's showing just how much more important he was and his role is and how much of an icon he is within that movie. The moment she talks about him and his talent and how we all go see the movie because of him, we see some grooming happening with him, quite a bit of it. So first we see him fix the right side of his jacket with his right hand. Then we see both hands come up quite obviously and pull the shirt out from under the sleeves of the blazer to make them visible. Now grooming gestures is anything that we do to fix our appearance. And it's usually a really good indication that our focus has gone from external to internal. We are now thinking about how we're coming off. And this is a very natural moment for that to happen because she's putting the attention on him. And he knows how the media works. He knows that the moment she starts talking about his talent, his gifts, a lot of those cameras are gonna whoop, point to him because she's now mentioning him. And so I think that thought of him like, ooh, we're talking about me now, is causing him to fix that appearance as he's feeling self-conscious. There's a gesture towards the end that's really gonna solidify, for me, how she emphasizes certain sentiments. And it's when she's saying how his performance gave us that little every boy on an extraordinary adventure. And we see this no gesture. So the no gesture is one of the most misunderstood gestures in body language. So often in comments on social media or even articles, I'll see people say that, oh, whenever you see someone do this, it's because they're being deceptive. First and foremost, there isn't a single gesture in existence that can indicate that someone's being deceptive. We don't all do the same thing when we're being deceptive, so get rid of that concept. That any one thing you could see allows you to know someone's being deceptive. But much less this gesture, because we use this for a lot of things. If someone gives you really unbelievable news and you don't believe it, you might be like, what? There's no way. So with disbelief, we often do this. We also see it often with disapproval or disappointment. So if you're thinking about something you did and you're not too proud of it, you might be doing this out of like regret or disappointment and you're being very genuine. And in her case, we're seeing it at a moment where she doesn't know the right words. She's searching for her words. And we do see this sometimes where someone's like, I, I don't know how to put this, which is very consistent for her with that throwaway negation gesture that we saw earlier. So it seems like for her every so often when she's thinking, I don't know what to say, or I don't know how to put this, we're seeing these signs of negation that aren't negating the statement, but her feelings towards not really knowing how to put this. Speaking of that hand gesture in this next clip, we're gonna see her do it again. It's not as extended, but it's that same kind of gesture, and she's really not saying anything negative or positive at all. She's just talking about how they made a movie. So that, again, is the reminder that for her, this kind of thing does seem to happen a lot with emphasis. It really was as if we had ambushed the home of this real little boy named Kevin to make a movie, and he just went along with it for the fun of it. <laughs> He's the dearest thing. Okay. Oh, oh, the scene where I had to um, drag him upstairs to sleep in the attic because he'd misbehaved, uh, and he says, uh, you know, he's mouthing off about the family, and I say, well, you'd be pretty sad if you woke up tomorrow morning and you had no family. And he said, no, I wouldn't. And I was supposed to say, then say it again. Maybe it'll happen. And I can't tell you how much that killed me. I could not wrap my head around saying something so horrific to this beautiful child. <laughs> okay, a couple of really great things in that one, including a moment that I've been waiting for months, hoping that in one of the analysis videos that we cover on the channel, it's gonna come up because I wanted to contrast it with something we've talked about very often on the channel. And it happens just after she says, he's the dearest thing. So as she's saying that, he's the dearest thing, right at the end of thing, we hear her voice start to tremble and it crashes. 
and her head goes down and we see the chin boss like this causing the lips to tighten as she goes down like this. Now this isn't the tightening of the lips. It's not a compression. It's the chin pushing those lips up and the head goes down. Then we see the hands come up like this in fists as she goes, okay, ah, uh, and then she perks up and she continues with the speech. And the reason I've been waiting for a moment like this in these videos is because that is pretty much exactly what it should look like when you're in a public place and sadness hits you for a moment. So on the channel, there's been numerous times where we looked at people who were in public giving a speech and when sadness hit, they displayed it. They showed it. They really wanted to make sure that people saw this sadness. And I said in all those occasions that that's not necessarily normal because sadness is a vulnerability and our reflex in the way that we evolved is to hide vulnerabilities immediately our instinct wants to hide sadness in public settings. And this is such a great example of that. Well, it's not sadness. She's not sad, obviously, but she's being overcome with an intense emotion and she's experiencing those tears of joy, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in this video. But as she feels that strong emotion hit and we could see she's displaying the face of sadness, we see she wants to hide it. So the head goes down and the hands come up in fists like this. Now there aren't any absolutes in body language. We say that all the time, but fists are very rarely a positive thing. There's almost no situation in which you'll see someone gesturing with fists like this in a positive moment. When our fingers come inwards like this, this could mean defensiveness, it could mean aggression, it could mean we're, we're feeling like we need to protect ourselves, but it's rarely a good thing. When we're irritated, it happens a lot. One really big exception to this is when someone's excited, more specifically celebrating a victory or an achievement. You might see someone go like, yes, like this, or yeah, like that, or even raise the hand in a fist, like, yes, I did it. And we, we see this. I don't know why it's quite consistent in that moment, but outside of that, fingers coming inwards typically are not a great sign. So in this case, we're seeing that it's irritating. We're like, come on, get yourself together. And we even said, Jess, we even hear that, ah, like shake it off. So the sadness comes in, she hides it, she shakes it off, comes back up and keeps going with the speech. That's what it normally looks like when emotion hits us in public. There is something so sweet in her choice of words there. Not necessarily her choice of words, but there's a shift in the tense of the verbs that she's using. So she's speaking in the past, right? She's saying how it felt like they hijacked this house of a boy named Kevin to make this movie and he just went along with it, past, past, she's telling the story in the past, and then she looks at him and says, he's the dearest thing, not he was the dearest thing, which would make more sense, right? We, she, she's talking about when he was a child. You know, he just went along with it, he was the dearest thing. She didn't say that, she said, he is the dearest thing. So she changed the tense to now, and it's just so sweet, and I think that's part of the reason she breaks down in that moment, because she realized that all these years later, this grown man is still that sweet little boy. And he just went along with it for the fun of it. <laughs> He's the dearest thing. And there's a lot of that feeling throughout this entire thing. Her speech, even his speech. It's like they played mother and son in these two movies ages ago, but there's still very much that motherly feeling towards him. Even in the beginning, when they hugged, he said, thanks mama. She said, darling baby. That was a very authentic hug. In a lot of the way she talks about him throughout her speech, we could feel in the way that she chooses her words, in the way she refers to him, that there's a very, very mama bear feeling there. We even feel that when she's talking about the scene where she dragged him up to the attic because he misbehaved. And we kind of see her turn towards him. We see a slow blink as she turns towards him. And this is a look we very commonly see when parents are telling a story of when their child did something as a child that got them in trouble. And you kind of see this, you know, so he did this thing and they kind of look at him as they're telling the story. And it's so funny because she's talking about a movie scene, like a script, this was scripted. He didn't actually misbehave, but because of that bond, because of that relationship, it almost feels like it was her son actually misbehaving. And then once again, to keep up with this motherly vibe, she goes on to talk about the line she was supposed to deliver to him to say, then go ahead and wish to not have a family, maybe it'll happen. 
and we see so many signs of nervousness. We see her pause, we see this nervous chuckle, she doesn't really want to say it. She says, then I was supposed to say, not I said, because in fact she did say it. She delivered the line, she's saying, I was supposed to say, we call this psychological distancing, I was supposed to say it. She's not embracing it like her line, like all the other lines she talked about. And then we're seeing that nervousness, and as she's talking about the line, having delivered it, and how she felt about it, again, we see that fist bumping on the podium like this. So that is a genuine moment of her having a hard time with that line. And again, that only makes sense because of this feeling she had towards this boy. You know, what reason does she have to be emotional about that? She's an actress, it's a line, it's a script, it's fiction, but you could physically tell that she had a hard time with this line towards this boy that she considers her own son. Okay, now we're gonna go on and look at the rest of her speech and one line that really caught my attention that I'm curious to know what you guys think about. Then we're gonna look at some of his speeches as well. There's some great stuff there as well. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. And for regular viewers who wanna encourage the channel, I will leave a link in the description where you can learn more about the memberships and how you can join. Your sense of humor. It's a sign of intelligence in a child and a key to surviving life at any age. And you have, uh, from what I see, you have brought that sense of sweet, yet twisted, <laughs> yet totally relatable sense of humor to everything that you have chosen to do since Home Alone. Macaulay, congratulations. You so deserve your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. And thank you for including me, your fake mom who left you home alone not once but twice <laughs> to share in this happy occasion. I'm so proud of you. God bless you. Okay, so at the end we saw that same hug, you know, warm embrace, pulling towards each other, and again with that arm rub at the end, and a face touch, a very, you know, open palm face touch, very comforting. We hear that high-pitched laughter of hers, haha, of excitement, again, same as the first hug. So again, we have a very warm hug from two people who feel a lot of affection towards each other. Another thing some of you may have caught is again that hand gesture. It wasn't as obvious because she was turned towards him, but as she said, everything you've chosen to do we saw that hand again, and that time, again, it's not a negative thing, so like everything, so emphasizing like all the things, and we're seeing the hand move like this, so again, baseline, baseline, baseline for her. Somebody else, if I'm talking to somebody else who doesn't often emphasize this way, or consistently does this with negations, then when that happens, I might say, okay, there's some sort of conflict or negation here, but for her, often with emphasis. Body language wise, we're seeing a lot of the same stuff from earlier, but there is one line that really caught my attention. And it's one that I'm familiar with, but I'm curious to know what you guys think. So she's talking about how humor in Hollywood is important. And she's about to say that he brings that sense of humor to all of his roles, but she stops. We hear this verbal leak like, uh, like it's important for her to stop and self edit right in the middle of that statement where she goes from what I see. So it's important for her to say, so the statement isn't, you bring that sense of humor to all your roles. It's, you brought your sense of humor from what I see to all your roles. Now that's really interesting. There's a self-edit there, but it's not just any self-edit. It's a self-edit that busts an absolute statement. So this is something we often hear when somebody's about to say something that sounds very absolute, but then they say something to minimize the absolute aspect of it. So I might tell you, for example, that I believe Benedict Cumberbatch is an amazing actor and I love every movie he's done. Well, the ones I've seen. So I might correct that statement. And this happens in one of two cases. So in this case, it's one or the other, maybe both. The first case is when we know that others might disagree. So if, for example, I'm aware that there are a lot of people out there who don't think Benedict Cumberbatch is a great actor, I might say that because I don't want people to hear me and be like, oh, come on, how could you think that? How could you think everything he did is great when he did this one movie that was terrible? So by saying, well, everything I've seen, I'm leaving the possibility that he's not the greatest actor for a fact in every role. There might be some roles out there where he wasn't that great, but I haven't seen those. He's great in everything I've seen. So it adjusts the statement from fact to opinion. The second place we see this kind of self-edit where we break an absolute statement is in honest people. It's the mark of an honest person because 
People who are honest have a hard time making big, bold, absolute statements like that because they're aware that they don't have all the information to make that statement. So they often self-correct. So I have a really interesting relationship with deception. On stage as a performance, obviously I've made a profession out of deception. I'm a mentalist. Mentalism is very much based in trickery. So when I get on stage and I make it seem like I can read people's minds and I know what they're thinking and I predict things, there's a lot of trickery in that, but I don't see it as deception because I'm open with the audience as to what mentalism is. So I see it more as live fiction rather than deception because the audience is aware, the audience is told that there's some trickery and psychology being used to make it seem like we can read minds. A lot of mentalists don't do that. They come up, they claim to be psychic, they claim to be experts at reading people, and they use the same trickery, the same psychology, the same body language as a mentalist like me who says, nope, this is tricks and psychology. Now off stage, it's a different story. I have zero tolerance for dishonesty. It's a big reason why I chose to do what I do because I severely dislike dishonesty. Even like exaggerations or embellishments, they just bother me, stick to the facts. So even when I talk about mentalism, it's so important for me off stage to be very clear on what it is. It's also the reason very often in my videos, you hear me say things like, almost always or in my experience because I don't want to make absolute statements because very few absolute statements are ever true. The reason I'm saying all this is because I recognize myself in that statement. Quite often I slip up and make an absolute statement and I immediately have the urge to self-correct. So I might say something like, you know, I come back from a restaurant and go, that was the best meal I've ever had. Well, one of the best meals I've ever had. So I'm not okay with letting that absolute statement remain on the record. So this is something we often see in people who value honesty. So in her case, it could be one or the other or both. So it could be that she's aware that some of his works since Home Alone have been heavily criticized. So when she says that he brought this amazing sense of humor to everything that she's seen, she's leaving that open for opinion. So basically she's saying, there might be stuff out there that wasn't good that I haven't seen. You're entitled to your opinion, that's fine, but from what I've seen, this is what you did. It could also be because she places a lot of importance on honesty and that absolute statement, the absoluteness of that statement irritated her. So she self-corrected into saying, not everything, but as far as I know, as far as I've seen, you've done this. So let me know in the comments which of the two you think it is. Is it her being aware that people might disagree, so kind of keeping that door open and turning fact into opinion, or is it adhering to honesty and saying that, well, I, I can't make the statement that it's all that way, just from what I've seen. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Let's talk about him really quick. So at the end of her speech, he's moved by what she said, he's emotional, and we see a couple of things. One, when he laughs, not just there, but other times she's talking as well, he laughs with his shoulders. We see those shoulders wiggle as he laughs. The second is, right at the end there, as he's wiping his tears, it's not just a quick wipe away, we really see this display. The hand is completely open, and he has these slow gestures, and he goes up and does it numerous times, and it's pretty much on display. So, Macaulay Culkin is a very interesting individual. There are very few people on this planet who don't really have life experience not being famous. You know, most people who find fame in, even as a teen, but you know, mostly 20s, 30s as adults, they did a whole bunch of their life as not famous, and then they became famous. We're talking about a kid here who was famous very young, and not just famous, mega famous. He started one of the biggest movies ever made. So his whole life, he's been in the limelight, he's been in front of cameras, he's been in movies. He doesn't know what it's like to not be famous. I think he's constantly aware that there are eyes on him, that he's being watched. And I think that in this moment, to highlight the emotional impact of what she said, knowing that there's gonna be articles about this, knowing that there's gonna be videos published about this, I think he wanted a moment. It's not necessarily that he's exaggerating that, like he's getting on the mic and like starting to weep and cry, oh, it was so sad. But I do think that in that moment, he did make a moment of that for the media to know that her speech got to him. I think the tears are real. I think he's actually emotionally moved by this, but I don't think he has a problem letting it be known that he was emotionally affected by your speech. He's okay with that. And we see some of that in his own speech as well. So his own speech is making him quite emotional. 
And I think that's totally normal, by the way. I don't think he's lathering it on there on purpose and saying, oh, look at how emotional I am. This is so emotional. He's not being over dramatic. I think he's experiencing legitimate worm emotions during the speech, and he's totally fine with displaying that. So let's take a look. I, I, I just, there's so many people that I love, and to feel that love back is just amazing. So thank you. Um, Um, Catherine, Natasha, thanks for, uh, for all your kind words and your stories and stuff. Um, you know, it's, you made, you made, uh, my, my kid's dad, their papa, look good. Uh, yeah, lastly, but not leastly, uh, I'd like to thank Brenda. You are absolutely everything. Um, uh, you're my champion. You're you're the only person happier for me today than I am. <laughs> um, you're not only the best woman I've ever known. You're the best person I've ever known. Uh, you've given me just all my purpose. You've given me family. Um, you know, and after the birth of our two boys, you become one of my three favorite people. <laughs> you're somewhere in there. <laughs> but um. I love you. I love you so much. Um, so yeah, to, to wrap things up, uh, and in the spirit of the holiday season, I just want to say uh, Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. <laughs> okay, so his speech is actually quite longer than that. He thanks a lot of different people, but it's a lot of the same mood, a lot of the same atmosphere, a lot of gratitude, a lot of love. And I want you to notice there at some point when he's talking about his wife, which is where he got the most emotional, I would say. We do see attempts to stop getting overly emotional. We do see those pauses. We do see the chin go down when that emotion hits. We see hand to chest a couple of times. And hand to chest is a very genuine gesture. The research shows that when we see hand to chest on someone, we perceive that person as being more genuine in that moment. And not only that, but when we put our hands to our chest, we tend to behave more genuinely. So he's feeling that emotion and he's not, again, he's not really aggressively leaning into it, but he's okay with it being there. But there are attempts there to, to mitigate it, to stop it before he goes on. So it's a pretty good balance. But throughout this whole thing, we are seeing genuine expression of emotional overload from him. Something that if you were to just show me a picture of, I would say sadness. We're seeing those chins come up. We're seeing tears. So we're seeing things that look like sadness, but there's no sadness here. This is a very happy occasion. Which brings me to one of my favorite studies in all of social psychology, which we talked about in last week's video, but I want to talk about it again because I really do love this study and it's the holidays and we should be talking about things like this. And this study was massive. It was done with thousands of subjects over dozens of countries, so it's really wide-reaching and includes a lot of research all coming together. And it was all about tears of joy. Why we look sad and cry in moments that aren't sad. Why does that happen? And it was narrowed down to four reasons. Across cultures, pretty much anywhere in the world, there are four things that seem to cause us to cry or look sad in moments of positivity. The first one is amusement. So quite simply, sometimes we're laughing so much that we start to cry. That one's a little bit different than the other ones because we rarely see a face of sadness there. It's just we're crying so much. We often see like this look of just exasperation, but rarely sadness. We're, we're usually smiling and laughing with this one, but we still do see tears. These are the tears of amusement and they happen when we're laughing a lot. The second one is beauty. In the face of beauty, we tend to not only tear up, but we see the face of sadness as well. It affects us in a way that brings out the expression of sadness. And beauty could be anything from seeing something beautiful in nature, or beautiful music, or art. And this is usually something that's gonna give us chills. So when we have chills with those tears of joy, typically it's related to beauty. And it's also very consistent with that feeling of awe when we're amazed. Next up are the affectionate tears of joy. So these happen when we're feeling unexpected kindness or exceptional love 
towards someone. So the tears you see at a wedding, for example, the tears you see in situations where love is being exchanged, where there's compassion. And this one is often associated with a feeling of warmth. So when you have that, the, the warm fuzzy feelings cause the tears of affection. Finally, one of my favorites to spot in behavioral analysis, because I find this really reliable, is not just the tears, but again, the full facial expression of achievement whether we are proud of someone or proud of ourselves. And this one is very consistent with having overcome obstacles. So when we have overcome obstacles and we've achieved something, we see this. So very often we see someone celebrating a great big victory and we might see this. Or witnessing someone else do that, we might have the tears of joy. So think about how sometimes we watch a movie and at the end, when we see someone really struggle with something and they accomplish it, whether it's a biography movie or a complete fiction, right at the end there, when they get the thing, it's a positive moment. We're not sad or crying when the obstacles are happening. It's at the end, we have the face of sadness, we have the tears of achievement. The reason this is my favorite is not only because I often spot it in my cold reads. You know, when I'm talking to someone, I could see that face of someone that made them really proud or involved obstacles, and I use that in my readings. It's not just that. It's also because research can explain this one. It's basically the sadness that was built up during the obstacles, but that we don't want to show because we have to be strong in those moments coming out once the obstacles have been overcome. So when we're dealing with hardships, our body is in stress. And we know that when we're stressed, we can't show vulnerability. So when we feel safe, when it's all over, we feel okay with letting it all out. It's the awareness of the troubles just completely coming out because you overcame it. This is the exact same reason why very often we come indoors from the cold and once we're indoors in the warmth, we go like this. We're not doing that outside in the cold, we're doing it because the cold is, it's vulnerable. We're, we're in survival mode. We can't show weakness as a reflex, but once we get away from that, now that we're safe, it, we're reacting to the obstacle. Same thing for the tears of achievement. So there it was, a really warm, fuzzy event, two great speeches, a lot of emotion, and some really great behavioral analysis. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to quickly reiterate what I said in last week's video. Well, two things. The first is I worked on something really awesome and exciting that I can't wait to share with you guys. I'm just waiting for the green light by the decision makers to let me know that it's okay to announce it, which should come in the week, max two weeks after this video is released. And I'm really excited for you guys to see that. Keep an eye on the community page. I'm probably gonna announce it there. And then we'll talk about it in later videos, but I'm really excited for you guys to see that. The second thing is we're in the middle of my busiest season as a performer because the holidays bring a lot of uh, corporate events, you know, uh, holiday parties that I actually fly out to destinations to perform at. So I really don't know what my upload schedule is gonna be like. Uh, I'm really trying hard. You know, this one is between two travel dates. So I'm gonna try to upload, but I really don't know if I'll be able to during the coming weeks. So if I don't see you before the holidays, happy and safe holidays to you and your families. And again, please forgive me if I miss a couple of weeks. I'm trying to balance the performances with the videos. That being said, I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I thought it was a lot of fun. For me, this movie is such an iconic part of my life. So it was really great to see this dynamic still exists all these years later. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments and I'll see you on the next one.